I want to start, before we sort of jump into things, one, um, I don't know if you've all noticed there have been some conversations about Facebook in the world right now. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, Mark went to Congress and your boss, Shrepp, was in the EU testifying. I'm going to not go too deeply into Cambridge Analytica and, like, all the sort of stuff raising there. One is um, just, I think it's probably mostly above both of your respective pay grades. Um, that's, like, I don't want to ask people questions that they actually don't have the answers to definitively. Um, the other part is, I, as somebody, like I, I run a software company, I've been in tech a long time, the, the mechanics of how we get to the experience of using Facebook, which all of us do, or billions of people do, is the thing that's rarer. It's very easy, I think, to sort of say, like, this thing makes me uncomfortable, or this thing is, you know, a challenge in the world, and I sort of want to get this unique lens that both of you have in there. So I just want to address that first, because um, I personally have no uh, uh, reluctance to, to criticize Facebook on those things. I think. Uh, the day that Mark testified at, um, in Congress, I, I did an op-ed for the Washington Post, which was very pointed. Um, but I also am very mindful of, like, it's hard work to make these things, and I, I sort of want to use the time well. Uh, the other thing is, I want to hear from all of you. We want to hear from all of you. Um, we're using Slido to ask questions, so that's sli.do. You can go to on your phone. There's a code C534 that you'll put in to ask questions. We're gonna have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, I know you all probably already have questions and should feel free to submit those all the way through. Uh, and we'll get those to be able to um, hear the questions from you as we go on. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, there's so many things we can jump into. Facebook is um, it's sort of like the elephant in the dark room. Everybody has a different vision of what it is to them, what their experience is. I'd love for each of you to start with talking a little bit about Sort of, if you had a couple factoids or insights into what Facebook is or what you've seen being on the inside that are not obvious to those of us on the outside that are just users, um, that help redefine how you see Facebook. Well, um, I am about to hit six years actually next week at Facebook. It's my face firstery, as we call it. Wow. Inside, that's probably something you didn't know. The branding people didn't really work on that Facebook. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that nobody with branding expertise came up with that name. But <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating place to work. And I think a couple of things that might surprise you. First of all, not everyone who works at Facebook is a software engineer. It's actually a highly cross-discipline, very collaborative company. There's designers, researchers. Um, uh, data scientists, uh, there's artists, there's um, salespeople, of course, uh, there's lawyers, obviously. Um, just <laughs> everybody who's involved in making a platform that's this big and this widely used is just incredibly um, cross-functional. I think the other thing is that would surprise people is to see how self-critical the culture is. Um, we are our own biggest critics, and internally, uh, we talk a lot about what's going on with our products out in the world. How can we make it better? How can we fix the things that need to be fixed? It is um, a company full of people who are very passionate about the mission, but also um, extremely aware of the responsibility that goes along with building something that that many people use and that is having pretty broad effects on society. So I would say, self-critical um, and, and very, like, at least from a, a background and, uh, and domain point of view, pretty diverse. I don't know, what are your thoughts? Uh, as one of the people that uh, get criticized every day, I'd have to agree with that statement. So yes, <laughs> um, I, I'm going to just focus on a statistic that you probably um, hear a lot about when you think about, read about, um, and hear about Facebook, which is simply that there are two billion discrete users that the, that the platform serves. And just to contextualize that, because I think we can kind of go quickly over that, and like, okay, there are two billion, well, we'll see where they're at the next month or so on and so forth, um, that that was the population of the world in 1930. So it is, um, I think important because so many of us are used to, when we think about the place that we live in and what place means to us, it might mean the south side of Chicago, it might mean the city of Chicago, it might mean the Midwest, it could mean the US, and, and so on and so forth. And then you wrap your, have to wrap your heads around serving that at a much bigger level. 
And I'm going to return to that, I think, a couple of times, only because I think it's part of the context that can make some of the work that goes on inside the company understandable. Mm -hmm. The challenges, the ways we get it right, the ways we don't get it right, et cetera. So we get to the heart of the larger cultural conversations around Facebook right now. And a lot of it is about data collection and how our data is used and the, the ways that you know, Facebook makes its money. Mm -hmm. right? So there is this, this question, I think, that comes up a lot, which is um, uh, the phrase that I think is increasingly being used inside the industry uh, amongst uh, critics is surveillance capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the idea, and this is not just Facebook. I think Google mm -hmm. and, and, and many other companies, people talk about the collection of our data, the combining of our data, and the way it's used to, um, you know, in, in, the, in the product mindset, improve the experience, mm -hmm. right? And in the critic's mindset to do unexpected things or un un you know, desirable things um, is sort of intrinsic to the way that almost all of the big tech players make their money. Um, have you reckoned with, in, in building product, designing product, tensions between what business wants, what the business model wants, mm -hmm. what the, the, the infrastructure of advertising is, and what a user wants. How do you, how do you, how do you balance that? Uh, it's a really good question, and uh, I've been in the middle of that for a number of years, because when I joined six years ago, I actually joined to build the design team on the business side of Facebook, which is not an area that I'd actually gone deep on in the other roles that I had. But I, I don't like it when design distances itself from the realities of creating a sustainable business, because if you care a lot about what a company is trying to accomplish, you need to make sure that they have a really robust business model in order to keep doing that thing. And at the time, it was right around, actually, fun fact, I started the night before the IPO. There was no financial benefit to that, but it was a really fun time. <laughs> to, it was, and then the next day, NASDAQ broke. But, <laughs> but it, it, was, um, it was a really exciting time. But at the time, we actually had no ads on mobile. <laughs> And that's actually hard to think about. It's just six years ago um, that we had a big shift to go through because the transition to mobile was so fast and it was uh, actually a threat to our business. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, how do we actually create momentum around creating really good experiences? And, and, and I was new to that, but I was committed to it because I cared a lot about um, the, 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 the mission that we were trying to accomplish. And, the whole time that I've been working inside the company, I, I have been uh, impressed with the extent to which we try to keep a long view of things. And this is where, I think, in the long run, you end up doing right, even though in the short run, you can make some mistakes. Because companies like Facebook or Google, really any company that is trying to create something of social value in a for-profit context has multiple motives mm -hmm. <laughs> that you have to balance, right? There's the profit motive, because we're obviously not a nonprofit, right? So we do have a motive, uh, and actually a fiduciary duty as a public company to make sure that we are a sustainable business. You have an innovation motive, because a lot of people are just attracted to the idea of doing something really big and impactful in the world. And then you have the social good motive, right? Is a lot of people attracted to companies like Facebook because they believe that technology can do good in the world. If you are short term in your decision making of like, oh, how can we like squeeze more revenue out of this? Or how can we like grow a little bit more? And you don't think about the long term repercussions of those decisions, that's where you go off the rails. And the key is to look far enough out where those motives realign. Because if you are thinking about a long term healthy business, it is rare to, to navigate that long-term view if you're doing things that are bad for people, <laughs> right? It's, that's not a great business model. And so I think the way to navigate the tension uh, that can exist within our business model is to keep that long view. The reason that ads make sense for us is because it allows us to offer a product for free to two billion plus people, and there is no other model that we've discovered that allows us to do that. In addition to the fact that advertising 
allows small businesses to grow better than any other <laughs> product that's out there. So there's a variety of reasons why advertising is a really good model for us. It doesn't mean that there aren't challenges. And we haven't always navigated that tension in, in the best ways. And you know, we constantly have to stay focused on making sure that we're making those long-term decisions. But we didn't, we didn't accidentally fall into this model. It was very much what's the best way to connect as many people as possible and do that in a way that is affordable. I mean, over 85% of the people who use Facebook are outside the United States, and the majority of them cannot afford to pay for products. So if we made a decision that went in a different direction, it would be in conflict with our state admission. Again, that being said, we can and need to do a much better job creating transparency around how advertising works, the kinds of data we're collecting, what we use it for, making sure that there is value that is immediately understood by people about where that data is going and how we're using it. And we need to be doing a significantly better job of that. You see that um, in terms of the regulation that's happening in Europe and the experiences that we are starting to roll out and will roll out globally um, over time, just to give much greater transparency around the controls that exist so that it doesn't feel so black box. I don't know if you have anything else no, to add no. on that, but I'm curious, sort of, so you're adding to that the, you know, a lot of your perspective from your prior research is about mm -hmm. communities and interactions that are around, you know, whether it's conflict or harm reduction or, or these other, other concepts. I'm curious about, you know, one, you took a big turn from academia into, um, uh, into private business and, and one of the biggest in the history of the world, right? That's a big shift, <laughs> and I'm curious about what you brought to bear on that. Like, what, what's a story of something that you identified as a risk or a harm internally were able to advocate for, um, you know, or were not successfully able to advocate for, but I'm curious about like, how you bring that perspective into influencing product and, and, and the experience people have on Facebook. So you might have seen a, uh, a, a bit in the news recently about the release of comprehensive community standards in the company. Um, that we're making our policies um, more accessible, more understandable, clear, transparent, et cetera, so that people can know how we enforce, how we think about the platform, what, what should stay on it and what should not. Um, that is, I think, uh, I'm really proud of the number of people in policy and research design, just in a, in a cross-functional sense, that worked on that initiative. And, I think most people probably, when they think about things like terms of service or, or policies, they probably kind of scoot past them quickly. Right? Has they anybody in the room ever read the terms of service on a website or app that you use? <laughs> Any hands? Yeah, it's one, two, three, three. Three, okay, that's good. We're... Okay. Exactly, there so, you go. So, good. Um, you could bury like you could bury a novel in there and nobody would notice, right? Well, he's talking about something slightly different, yeah, not okay. terms of service, right, but, but it's like what content's allowed on the platform versus yeah. not. Yeah. Right. And, and so why am I taking a particular kind of nerdy joy in that? Uh, <laughs> because the genesis of that was closer to the kind of work that I was doing mm -hmm. uh, before I came to Facebook, and that is, just as an example, I want you to just have this picture in your head. Imagine if you uh, were stopped by a police officer and you didn't know. Um, exactly if you were going to get your license taken away when they stopped you. Now, of course, you would know if you were speeding, et cetera, because you have, let's say, five or six points, and you know if you have one point or this is your first ticket that you've got a long way to go. It's clear. You can find that out. It's sort of ingrained, so on and so forth. Well, when things don't, are not clear, when they're not transparent, when they're not, the information is not given to you, you may act in ways that reflect confusion, or you may act in ways that reflect uncertainty, and so on. And so the step of getting to a point of being clear and transparent was driven in part by a whole set of academic understandings mm -hmm. on the outside of the company by experts who saw in offline worlds, in policing, or again, you're just your department of motor vehicles, what works. And so while the policy may be the thing that happens at the very end, and it might be, you know, it's more, but probably boring for most people, or it's not something you're going to engage when you think about Facebook. It reflects a process of learning that I, that I found um, was really nice to see, and it was something that I had worked on, and mm -hmm. just, just felt very proud to be a part of that. So let me, let me get deeper into that, because what you're talking about is almost a sort of three strikes you're out policy around the way people are allowed to use the platform. 
right? Like there's sort of this evolution in like what's permitted, what's accepted, what's promoted kind of thing. Um, what are the inputs that you talk about outside researchers? Um, are there people in the outside? Were there, you know, if I'm an ordinary user, how do I get heard by you in shaping that policy? Like what's the path there? Part of that release was that we have uh, an appeal system that we're rolling out, mm. which will be much more robust through the year. So if there's feedback that users want to give about a particular decision, that decision is going to be taken into account um, and be used as signal to figure out exactly how to make policies more transparent, more understandable, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Another way is just the way research is done in and of itself. Um, I was trained uh, as, a, as a scholar who was an ethnographer, and as an ethnographer, we do everything kind of by ourselves, um, which is how generally most academics work. You couldn't have that experience at Facebook, which is why I love it there. You're, you're in the field with designers, you're in the field with people who are writing content, and, and you're in the field with engineers. Um, it's a collective effort to share ideas. And so you're always going to find things that you otherwise couldn't see yourself. And I, I think that's a really fun part of the way innovation works uh, in the company. I key into this because I think, the, you know, not just Facebook, but all the major tech companies are reckoning with their place mm -hmm. in society right now. And the, the strong sense I get from ordinary users, and even those of us in the industry, is a, a sort of a lack of control of agency, right? Like these, are, these things have, are in my life. I mean, I think they, the average American checks their phone about 150, 200 times a day now. If they have a smartphone. It's this wildly, uh, it's like three hours a day with a thumb on the glass of the phone. And, um, and yet not a very strong sense of like, I can tell this company mm -hmm. I would, I would like this, right? I, I could like mm -hmm. stuff, but I can't really sort of say, mm -hmm. what's this product going to be like? Um, I, I'm curious about how much that larger climate of, like, because even if somebody says, I like Facebook, but I don't trust Google, that still affects you, right? Like, it's still the sense of, like, these are, this is all on my phone. It's all on the same device. And so I don't know who sees that information. Um, and, and I see this even with some of the back and forth about, you know, Tim Cook talking about, look, I wouldn't be in that position in respect to Facebook. And it's like, well, he might draw that distinction, but people are getting to Facebook through their Apple phone, so mm -hmm. this is an arbitrary thing from a user standpoint. So I'm curious about how much does that climate of whether we call it mistrust or skepticism or, or whatever, control agency um, for users filter through in the work you're doing right now? Like, how much is that felt inside the company of like this impacts the work? I think it's the number one thing that we're talking about. Because there are things that are happening now that don't align with how we want to be operating in the world, right? I mean, we, it is uh, difficult, although something being hard is not an excuse. Um, mm -hmm. It is difficult with such a large, diverse audience to figure out how to do that at scale, to give everybody agency, because you know, we also have to be careful not to export um, a set of values yeah. <laughs> from yeah. Northern California, not just the rest of the United States, but the rest of the globe where, you know, what's right and wrong and the appropriate level of agency, that varies pretty dramatically from culture to culture. That puts us in a pretty difficult position sometimes to take very strong stances on this is the right way for people to use the product and this is the wrong way. That being said, I do think, you know, you touched on a number of dimensions on it, but I think if we even just take the idea of people checking their phone too much and the idea of overuse, if you right. will, um, we need to get into a space where we can figure out how to internalize people's values when they're being most mindful. Mm. Not just what we can get people to do, but what they would do if they were being truly reflective about their behavior. Mm. That's way easier to say than yeah. it is to do, yeah. but that's the aspiration because again, getting back to what I was saying about the business model, it is not a good business model to do something that makes people unhealthy. Like it's, it eventually will catch up with you. And so what we're engaging in now is what are the right ways to do that, you know, is, you know, in, in the ways that can help people feel, not just feel a sense of control, but actually have real agency over their, over their relationship with technology. And, and you know, we will continue to explore that. As Sudhir was saying, a lot of that has to do with getting external expert advice, because mm -hmm. even with the best of intentions, it's sometimes hard to 
step outside of you know how you've been you know looking at and seeing these things that you're building, and so that outside expert expertise. Mm -hmm. Um, is critical to us making informed decisions. Do you think there's been a change in a willingness to listen to those outside voices, or like, has there been a defensiveness, or is that something that you think wasn't there? And ever since I've been there, mm -hmm. that practice has existed. I think the sense of urgency mm -hmm. around tapping into it in a bunch of different ways certainly has grown over the past couple of years because, you know. The role of a designer mm -hmm. or a researcher or a software engineer, it, it has changed a lot over the years, but I'm not sure we've realized how much. Mm -hmm. The, you know, if you think about it as a camera lens, like the, the aperture needs to open mm -hmm. <laughs> quite a bit wider right. than it has been. Um, the way that I've been thinking about it for myself and my team is, you know, I'm gonna try to like, describe a four, like a quadrant with my arms. All right. Because thank God we have no PowerPoint or keynote right. going on. Um, we need a chalkboard. That's right, a whiteboard, yes. Yeah. So if you think about a, a quadrant, and this x-axis is what you're building, and on this far extreme is a pixel, or maybe it's a line of code for an engineer, and all the way at my elbow is the ecosystem in which, within which your product operates. Somewhere in the middle is the product, right? So you got pixels, just like the atomic unit, and then over here is the environment within which that product exists. The y-axis is the audience for whom you're designing. So down here is a single person, up here is all of society. Most design and development is down here in this quadrant. Right. It's in the product pixel human space. One person, one button. That's right. Yeah. And it's also the space where it's like, I have this audience I'm intentionally designing for. Here are their use cases, and those are gonna be the only things they do with the product that I've developed. And I am you know, imagining that these are gonna be the outcomes. Well, at the extreme of this x-axis, you get into systems effects, mm -hmm. where, like for instance, if you develop a detergent to do some kind of particular cleaning, it may do that task very well, but when it's released into the water system, mm -hmm. it may have effects on plant and animal life that you did not realize it was gonna have. On the y-axis, you get up into this societal zone mm -hmm. where you're gonna start to have effects on the way societal systems work. And, and so this is the space of like public health, criminal justice, like you were saying, political science, economic theory. That's the space in which we are operating when you're at two billion people. And that requires us to draw on an enormous amount of expertise that like software companies wouldn't normally think right. you'd have to be and in. This sounds like how the whole industry has changed, right? I started making totally. social networks or platforms 15, yep. 20 years ago. And, and you know, I first met Mark Zuckerberg in that context of maybe 12, 13 years ago, that like very, very early days of, of Facebook and we were sort of building networks and what the conversations were about is like how do you make this Thing actually run mm -hmm. like if you have a million users back then a million was still considered like, a lot of Ooh, people million, yeah. right <laughs> and and um a million dollars i thought was a lot of money back then apparently it's not anymore but the like the um depends who you are um for me it's a lot yeah the 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 com that conversation was can you keep the thing from just the app from falling over yes like can you make like they go to the website and it's running like that was that was where the bar was and to go from that to what is our impact on elections? What is our impact on yes. media manipulation? What is our impact on how people are treating each other in the world? Yeah. Um, they are, those are different fields. Totally. Right? Like that is a different area of discipline. Yep. I, I'm curious about like, how, does, how do you, as an organization, say we, we need to reckon with we are a different thing in the world and, and technology is like this almost incidental part of that, right? Like you don't take it for granted, it's hard work, but it's like, Yep. Compared to the actual problem you're solving, I, I think you're like your your place at the company seems like an artifact of this evolution, right? Well, yeah, I think it goes back to where I, what I was saying about this is a company that is I think is characterized by humility and by learning. That's um, interesting. And both of those. I don't think the public perception. How many people feel Facebook is humble? Is humble? So that's a that's a really that's really interesting. I mean, I. I was, I was struck by how much people are actually very humble and very grateful to be working at this scale and on these kinds of problems. It, it really, 
Um, it kind of seeps into everything that we do, um, in, in, in part because everyone is watching. I mean, you're, you know that you have that kind of effect and you get that feedback right away. So um, I think I really like that part of the company that they learn. Um, the, uh, one way of, I hear your question mm -hmm. is, I sometimes think about that Churchill line about, um, you know, I can't get it quite right, but about democracy. Mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of better than everything else that we have. It's not a perfect system, but it's, it's the best one we have. That of all the, it's, best, it's the best one of all the alternatives. And one of the reasons, if you study democracy or political systems, why they work in the best cases is that they strike the right balance between um, leading and contr between control and serendipity that you want to be able to, at scale, allow people to have some structure and facilitate in any interaction. In this interaction, we have chairs, we have a kind of a demarcation between a stage and, and, and it just it sets rules, it sets our parameters. But we can't have it so tight that if we were just reading from a card and, you're, and, and that, that wouldn't be that fun, it has to be a little creative. Well, that's, that's an element of risk. There's an element of kind of uncertainty. And that's where some of the fun comes in, I think, when you work at scale, is embracing that uh, notion of giving over or allowing uh, people to be really, really creative with a tool. Mm -hmm. And I often find, as a researcher, when I work with people and we go into a space, I'm just constantly blown away and surprised by what people are doing with the platform with a feature on the platform, never could have imagined it. Not only because we may not have time to imagine it, or we may be coming from our respective um, our bubbles and we don't, uh, we're not able to get out in the ways that we want, but also just because that's the fascination of the human spirit is it always will exceed our fondest caricatures. It's always going to surprise us. And there's an element of that that I think is hard to probably see from the outside that I couldn't see which is that not, that necessitates that we, like the team that I support um, and the place where I work, um, we have to deal with negative cases. We have to deal with mm -hmm. cases in which there's misuse, um, which is not fun, uh, but it's going to happen because part of creativity and part of giving over control and allowing people to make what they will of the platform is understanding and, and watching where they go and, and being observant of, of wherever they go. So it's interesting because you talk about there will be misuses, there will be negative cases. I mean. If you think about this of like what can go wrong, at two billion users plus, something will go wrong. Mm -hmm. How much of this choosing, like this is the domain to which we want to contain possible harms versus this other domain? I mean, is that the way that reckoning happens? Where it's sort of, you know, and, and um, so just for background for people, like there's a probably too often referenced problem in software design or, or, or design broadly of the trolley problem, mm -hmm. where people say you've got um, you know, a trolley on tracks and you're choosing whether uh, it is uh, essentially going to harm one group of people or another, and you have to make these ethical choices in the, in the yep. design of the system. Um, and it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't choice, right? There's no right answer. Both options are awful, um, and, and you choose one. How often is that the reckoning, or is it like this is unknown, and we don't know which area we're going to um, dive into? You know, we often like see situations or have requests come to us even with data use mm -hmm. that provide those tensions. Right. So a pretty good example is um, uh, humanitarian organizations, you know, coming to us saying, hey, you know, part of a problem with disaster relief is we don't know where the people are. Mm -hmm. But you do. Can you work with us? to help us understand where people are in the wake of a natural disaster mm -hmm. and proactively message to them where they can find food and water. And so Red Cross and UNICEF and these other like highly respected humanitarian organizations can get help and assistance to where the people are. And you know, sometimes I'll ask an audience, and you guys are like kind of in the dark, so I won't, but sometimes I ask an audience, who do you, you know, who out there thinks that, you know, Facebook should anonymize that data, but like it is a little bit, you know, creepy, like mm -hmm. people didn't know that we were going to use that data yeah. in the context of a natural disaster. There was no explicit consent. That's right. Yeah. And um, it's always amazing to me that there is a clear divide. It's not always 50-50, but there are people who passionately are like, Absolutely not. 
you don't have the permission, explicit permission to use that information. And then there's another group of people that are like, that would be so immoral. <laughs> to not use that data to save those people if you have a chance. So there's absolute and certainty on both sides. Totally. <laughs> They're all sure they're right. And, um, you know, I mean, that's not a hypothetical. It really did happen. Yeah. And we oh. agonized over it. We conferred with outside experts. We figured out how does this align to our mission. And we decided, OK, we're going to partner with these third parties. We're going to anonymize all the data. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try to be of assistance in these natural disasters because it felt like the right call. It is a decision that reasonable people can disagree with. And so, um, you know, we come across those situations a lot. Yeah, this is interesting, too, because I think this ties into so there's some of your research around, um, you know, the criminal justice system and sort of related systems. Mm -hmm. And I live in New York City, and NYPD has been using social media data across all the mm -hmm. platforms in their policing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can, you know, I, I can't quote it verbatim, but I imagine you know Facebook has make, makes public statements like every big company. We comply with law enforcement demands yep. when they're you know the thing you're supposed to say. I guess yep. as a company, and yet what I see when I talk to the kids in you know our city in our neighborhood, especially you know um, at the height of stop and frisk and when NYPD was surveilling you know uh, houses of worship, um, was like I didn't consent to having my Facebook data shared in this way, and I don't trust NYPD to use it well, because this is an organization with a very fraught history of how it treats you know, particularly marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, I think the facile take that happens in pop culture is, well, you put it on the internet, you shouldn't, if you shouldn't put it out there if you don't want the whole world to see it, which is, I think, pretty far detached from a, a teenager's experience of yeah. using social media. And the other part that's not intuitive is um, I certainly was prone to uh, being a jackass when I was a teenage boy. And so I would, I would have bragged about all manner of things. If somebody said, I want you to look tough by saying you belong to a gang in high school, I can conceive of saying something stupid like that when I was 14. Mm -hmm. And you know, NYPD has put kids into the carceral system on the basis of that data. That's a, this feels like a sort of a variation of this complex problem, which is how do you internally reckon with um, sort of that second order dependency of the institutions that you are dependent on mm -hmm. may not be trustworthy and how do you make that decision? And especially I think that goes global with governments that are saying, well, we're the government in this region and we want this data and we can't, you can't trust that it's not going to be misused. Mm -hmm. You can't trust that it's not going to cause harm. How do, you, how do you make that judgment? How do you make a framework for that? I, I, Margaret might have some perspective on yeah. parts of that, that that I might not, that I probably don't have. Um, the, so I, I, apologize if I apologize if I don't hit every no, note, the, uh, There's a lot there. You can yeah. both sort of yeah. jump in. I, I hear that in a number of ways. Um, one is, uh, again, as someone who tries to help teams anticipate or understand use cases of uh, how the product is making sense in their lives as a tool, as a platform, in some cases as the only organ or vehicle for information. I mean, it's just, it's very mm -hmm. different in each place. Um, you will have situations in which your own, you have to kind of check the norms and the uh, assumptions that you're bringing in about safety or welfare, et cetera. A, a great case is that for a lot of the people in my friend network, we don't really um, think that deeply about sharing photos with other people. We don't think that photo sharing could be um, a, 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 a vulnerability. Some, a, a vulnerability that sometimes might, might, something that put, might put you into jeopardy because in our world it doesn't. I mean, it, of course, it depends on the photo being shared, uh, but it uh, it's not in and of itself. Do we see that as increasing vulnerability? Some parts of the world that just is not. You cannot make those kinds of assumptions, mm -hmm. and the sharing of photo, especially when it's gendered and it's a sharing of a photo of a woman in some societies, you're going to have to really take that into account. That that's going to have a meaning. Just the act itself, regardless of what's in the photo, just the act itself, and that could be a situation that leads to social vulnerability. It leads to a potentially um, a, a misuse case. Mm -hmm. um, so there are ways in which some of this is really dependent on cultural context and our ability to understand how police operate in different places, um, mm -hmm. how police operate in different parts of the world, in different cities with people who have different relations, and kind of listening to our um, and engaging our, our users. 
The other part that I want to be really mindful of and, and building, <coughs> excuse me, building somewhat off Mark, Margaret was saying earlier in terms of the history of the company, and as I think you talked about it earlier when you mm -hmm. said you met Mark Zuckerberg, and th the point was just to get it up and running. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'll never forget one of the, when I first started to shadow Chicago police officers and get a sense for their work, one of the, one of the things that they would say over and over that I, it took me a long time to understand is, I fail when I become a social worker. I'm a police officer, don't turn me into something that I'm not trained for. Not that I don't care for people, not that I don't want to help as a social worker might or offer therapy or whatever it happens to be, but I've not been trained for that job, I'm not prepared for that job. And one of the things that happens at Facebook I notice a, a, a lot is that you have a very dedicated group of people that are getting, being really responsive to what they're seeing and hearing, doing their best to kind of adjust to that with the tools that we have. And I think as you're gonna hear a lot more um, about us turning to the outside world, us turning to experts, mm -hmm. um, because there's a recognition that we have to be able to work with other people who have different skill sets on a problem, on an issue, on a use case. So. And, and globally all around the world, because yeah. again, you know, <laughs> We may study you know, systems in the United States and come up with solutions that are culturally appropriate there, but you know, to Sudhir's point, you go into you know, different places in the world and you're gonna find radically different contexts. Um, so that outside perspective is critical and diversity of perspective, both geographically and, and in many other dimensions, mm -hmm. uh, really important because uh, if, uh, we're not necessarily a reflection of the general <laughs> diversity right. of, of domain, background, uh, you know, ethnicity, mm. gender. You know, our industry is not a particularly diverse industry, and it's uh, a good understatement. It, yeah. it is a it is a big challenge because, of course, we're designing for the most diverse population that any company has ever designed for. Yeah, I mean, and, I think and our and our employee base does not reflect that. So. And it's, it's not an overnight problem. Right. Uh, the gender issue sh is more actionable than uh, underrepresented groups uh, uh, and other under, under, other underrepresented groups um, where you have to get way back into the educational systems mm -hmm. to kind of create different outcomes for you know, what people are studying, what they're prepared to do. Um, but that is a huge challenge for not just Facebook, but the yeah. whole industry. I mean, the, the platform was, to an approximation created as a private Ivy League network, that's right? right? Like it's, it's, it was sort of, to my mind, as somebody that's never been to those environments, it's like if you took you know, the Skull and Bones Club and like let's open it up to the world, like you would have to do a lot of changes architecturally <laughs> to sort of be like this is the clubhouse for everyone, yep. right? Um, and, and I wonder about that sort of how much of you know, design is destiny, like where you start mm. from, how far can you get from where you start to accommodate those things. And, and I, I look at that as very analogous to like civil society, right? Is yeah. this is a, you know, we can say all men are created equal and have these definitions of what the country is and also have been founded by, um, you know, people that owned others as property and enslaved them, right? Yep. So there's a really big change in like, how do we interpret these words? I'm curious about that, that evolutionary process. Yeah, you know, you have to go back even further, I think, mm. because, um, a friend of mine, Danny Hillis, who was like one of the original architects of the internet, mm. you know, we were talking about this and he was like, right from the beginning, mm -hmm. we did not put the protocols in place to yeah. be protective around bad actors because right. it was just a small group of academics and, right. and coders. Yeah, like email was designed to essentially not verify anything. That's right, that and, user, yeah. and so he was just like, we knew because we knew everyone else who was online that mm -hmm. they would just get booted socially. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the actual, original fabric of the internet mm -hmm. assumed good intent and good players. And so right. that reality like dramatically predates Facebook, but it's yeah. certainly- it's, it's sort of the next generation. That's of right, generation. that's right. And at a much bigger scale. Yeah, I mean, is, is there a tension, like is it possible to build a product for two billion people? Is, that, is there a fundamental issue there? Well, I think, uh, well, I mean, I think, I think it is because we have, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, but I'm asked, I mean, because like there are people who say, well, it's not for me or it's not working for me. Right? Yeah, I mean, like, is that part of the tension? Is that there's why? a reason we have a family of apps, right? Because yeah. different groups of people wanting to accomplish different things to connect in different ways. Um, some people want to do it visually and creatively. Some people want to do it in small groups and through a messaging context. Mm -hmm. And so the company is interested 
in exploring all the ways that you can bring people closer together, not just one you know, yeah. singular way. Um, but it's a good question, right? I mean, yeah. as you bring on the majority of the human race onto a single platform, what does that look like? It's part of why, you know, when I think about those quadrants, I think about, uh, I, I didn't intend to become an urban planner, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but that's it's, really what we, it's really what we are, right? right. And it's, our biggest cities are 10, 20, 30 million that's people. That's right. So your orders of magnitude that's smaller right. than this. So we're, we're way past precedented that's right. world here. Uh, there's this, so we talk about the two billion scale, the most radical correctives from the outside, so probably some regulation is coming, probably it's gonna be written by guys who apparently don't know how to turn on their VCRs, like that's bad. Um, I think the, the, the most radical sort of correctives people talk about in the regulatory world is they talk about breaking up Facebook, right? What I'm curious about is like, who knows whatever happens with that. From a product standpoint, mm -hmm. do you all talk about let's have more products, let's not have one or two or three multi-hundred million or billion user networks, like are you thinking proactively about what would it be like to build 10 Facebooks for all the different audiences we serve or 100 Facebooks so that we're not all on the same Instagram, we're not all on the same Facebook? Well, I think that where we get into that is Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. And allowing all of the products to function at different levels of scale mm -hmm. as opposed to feeling like the whole experience is gonna be your news feed. Right. The fact is, is Facebook groups has become like one of our fastest growing products and a large percentage of people <laughs> belong and are deeply involved mm -hmm. in a Facebook group that is materially important to their lives. Right. And I think figuring out how to provide a variety of scales for people to engage is a different way of approaching the question that you're right. asking. Like, so then the group is the product for them, for their experience? Yeah, so. Would you ever consider turning off the newsfeed? Like, could I have a Facebook without that? It's just the groups. I'm not making a feature request. I'm saying, like, is that, is, that, is, that a, is that a conversation you could have? I mean, we have all kinds of conversations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, newsfeed is, like, an incredibly powerful experience, mm -hmm. and it, it is, I think, really valuable in a lot of ways. So I think we would have to figure out how do we trade that off against, yeah. you know, giving people the power to turn. I'm not sure totally what turning it off means, except maybe yeah. splitting it out. Well, I think I'm, I'm pushing at how radical mm. a reckoning are you having right now, right? Because there's this mm. cultural reckoning with tech yeah. broadly, with Facebook as its place in the world, mm -hmm. with the unprecedented scale of all these technologies. Mm -hmm. And on the outside, whether it's in DC or in Chicago or in the world, mm. people are saying everything from, should, should Mark resign? Should the company be mm -hmm. broken up? Like, all, like there's, there's, yeah. there's no limits on the outside, right? Yeah. And so I wonder about inside, of like how deeply will you look and say, let's, there's no sacred cows here. Let's, let's sort of see what we can do. I mean, I th for me, my experience is most of Silicon Valley like spends a lot of time in that radical space. Mm, that's interesting. <laughs> um, and again, it's not always transparent to the outside world. The challenge when people are as interested in, as they are in Facebook is that like, there's a tension of how openly do you share what you're talking about internally because mm. even like casually mentioning something here yeah. would yeah. end up becoming news, right? Yeah. So Hopefully. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I do think that there is a tension there, mm -hmm. like, you know, we, we can and, and will and, and want to be more transparent, but, yeah. you know, the current environment makes it a little bit challenging yeah, to yeah. just talk off the cuff are... about things. No, no, I mean, I appreciate you both even being here because I think this is a, like, the default thing most organizations would do is you two would have canceled, right? Um, like, I've, I've been in communications and you'd be like, oh, you know, we're busy, we've got to update the app, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and that's... You know, I have to tell you, um, uh, the company and the communications team has been enormously supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I spoke at South by Southwest a month ago about yeah. similar topics. Um, we've got to be out there. We've got to show people who we are and what we stand for, mm -hmm. you know, what our, what our values are, yeah. because that is how we rebuild trust is to you know, humanize the people who are inside the company. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I think there's been a ton of support for, yeah. for us to um, you know, be coming out and, and engaging with people. That's great. I want to carry through on one of these things where we talk about that analogy to civics, to urban planning, which is something I always refer to mm -hmm. in building 
technology and communities. What do you think the lessons are we should be learning from what cities, governments, neighborhoods have done to when there have been you know, issues of trust, issues of communication? Um, I think that there are uh, two general areas that I think about that question from somebody who studies cities and from a sociological standpoint. Mm -hmm. And one, I, I don't know if I'm permitted to do this, but I'm gonna actually throw back a question sure. back to you, which is kind of... Ninja move. <laughs> <laughs> creating technological communities, you know, what works and how do, what in your experience yeah. have been the principles that people should start with or, or the, the kinds of helping people understand like the path dependencies. You need, if you start here, it's hard to get there, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But I, I think when I, when I think of the, some of the challenges and things that work at cities, I go back to something I was reverting to earlier, which is that understanding that at different levels of scale, different kinds of control and different kinds of um, uh, lack of control work, different kinds of governance mm -hmm. work. So Margaret was pointing to Facebook groups. Again, just if you just wrap your head around just this very basic thing that, that I'm just gonna nerd out for a second as a sociologist, <laughs> that you're creating a forum which is not a park. It's not where everyone can go and kind of meet each other. It is not a table in a restaurant. It literally has no boundaries. Now make that an ordered place of conversation mm. and exchange and interaction. And someone's coming from and, Europe. Yeah, and civility. And civil and <laughs> respectful and what would you need to do? What are the kinds of strategies and techniques? Well, you know, you can't probably watch everything that's happening in real time after a certain scale. So maybe you need people to, you need to build trust. You need to work with the group admins, which are things that we do. Mm -hmm. um, you need to set, you know, um, set some rules, but al also often people a chance to maybe, um, I'll give you an ex example of what works in, works in cities that we have used as a feature on the site. Um, learn to interact and solve problems with each other. Mm. So we have a feature called social resolution, resolution, excuse me, in which for certain kinds of um, behaviors or certain kinds of things where maybe someone uh, shared a photo or shared a text and you'd like to reach out to them uh, and ask if they could take it down, but you're not really sure how. It's not, an, it's not violating a policy necessarily. Right. It's, not, it's not against the rules, it's, it's just not the, right. Yeah, yeah, and it becomes harder for the authority figure, the big, you know, the, the person who's managing the platform to reach out, but maybe you'd like to do that. So social resolution is a tool that many people use that helps them to find strategies to reach out to someone whom they know at various degrees and say, hey, would you mind removing that? Um, it's causing me this particular kind of feeling. So it's equivalent to being neighborly and just sort of saying, hey, do you mind yeah. not doing that, parking your car in front of the driveway or whatever yes. it is? Yeah. And it right. creates something. It creates an expectation of, of trust. It creates, a, it creates a feeling. It creates a sentiment that, you know, you, you imagine, imagine moments where people might have said that to you. You've, you felt like you've come a little closer to them. Yeah. You've created empathy. You understand each other a little bit. So the, sometimes that is the key in many senses at scale. Is to very allow very few that. of our digital experiences allow us to be vulnerable, right? Yeah. So that's right. interesting. That was a product where we conferred with a lot of outside experts, yes. experts in conflict resolution. And the interesting thing that we found was the, the default language that we put into the user interface that allowed, so say you upload an embarrassing picture of me, mm -hmm. and uh, for a long time, I would maybe like report it as a policy violation, but as you're right. saying, it's not. Instead, Facebook's saying, hey, do you want to maybe ask mm -hmm. you know, that, that the photo get taken down? The default language that we put in the UI that helps somebody communicate, right. the difference between saying, take this photo down, I don't like this, right. and changing it based on outside yeah. expertise that said, this photo makes me uncomfortable. Right. Would you please take it down? And the effectiveness of that language right. <laughs> dramatically right. increasing the odds of a successful conflict resolution. So it's a good example of human-centered design accessing outside expertise. Because you know, part of the challenge is- But also is prompting that interaction, right? Totally. You're teaching, you're teaching Absol this is how you talk yeah, to people. Yeah, exactly, people, right? right? And so you know, I think the challenge sometimes in technology is as an industry, we convince ourselves that all the challenges that we're engaged in, it's like the first time humanity has ever dealt right, with right, conflict. Right. This is the beginning of history There's all nothing the time. to yeah. learn from yeah. the past in terms right. of human conflict. And so I think as an industry, gaining that humility to say, actually, mm. humanity keeps 
repeating the same stupid mistakes over and over again. <laughs> Let's make new and interesting ones yeah. and learn the lessons of past mistakes. So to that point, it sounds like you're learning a lot from cities, from public spaces, from, from how humans have interacted for 10,000 years mm -hmm. in civilization. And one of the questions that comes up when we build truly public spaces, um, and this is different because obviously this is a corporate owned spaces, what's your obligation to people who are not Facebook users? Most mm -hmm. of the world still does not use Facebook. Yep. Um, everybody's impacted by it. Yep. Um, how do you think about designing a product for the people that are not your users and not your customers? Well, I mean, there's a reason when I spelled out my quadrants, right. I didn't say the whole community. Mm -hmm. It's society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because a lot of people are affected by the use of products, even though they don't use them. So right. when we get into studying political science and public health, these are areas where we're explicitly getting outside the space of it. It's not just about keeping everyone in our community healthy. It's not just empowering, you know, in a democracy, all of the people who use our products. It is looking at the wider societal impact of the use of the products that we build. Um, and you know, we do that in user research, we do that certainly in the outside academic experts that we engage with, is to not limit our purview mm -hmm. just to people who are engaging in the product. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's exam specific examples of where we've, that I can think of where we've explicitly engaged in the larger piece. I mean, yeah, I'm curious and then about the election, example. the election interference stuff is obviously mm -hmm. an area where it's like mm -hmm. everyone is impacted if, right. if you know, democracy, you know, the de democratic process is, is uh, affected. So right. that's an area where we're explicitly, the goal mm -hmm. is to make that right for all of society, make sure that elections are free of interference. If I sort of look at what Facebook is doing. I think the, the biggest thing from the outside is you all are talking. You're being open about what your processes are. Um, that builds trust. Any, anything that helps people sort of say, I can have impact on this. Mm -hmm. I can have accountability for this. Do we see, like, how is Facebook going to use its own platform to listen to users? Like, how are you going to use these tools to say, like, does your design process say, like, there's testing. We put mm -hmm. this product in front of people and they either click on the button they don't or they click more on the green button than the blue button. But I think about like talking to people through there, like is there a group I can join on Facebook and sort of give you feedback? Is there a way to sort of explicitly be in the process as opposed to implicitly through my usage or the indirect research? Well, the irony of working on global open platforms is y the thing that you've built mm -hmm. ends up being the thing that people use to criticize you. Sure, yeah. <laughs> right? So like when we redesign a piece of YouTube and what do people do to criticize it is they like upload critical videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So they're like, great. Um, so, you know, and that's actually really powerful yeah. because we want to invite all the voices into the conversation. Yeah, so. I built blogging tools like 15 years ago and we were early and that was the first time we figured out we just gave everybody the power to publish at us <laughs> yeah. and tell us what we're doing wrong. Exactly. And it was like, back then it was an epiphany. Now we're like, this is just inevitable. They're going to complain. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a variety of ways that we try to understand how people are feeling about us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we regularly survey people to understand what their sentiment is around the company and mm -hmm. the products. Um, we certainly. Uh, study that sentiment and you know the things that are people saying are, people are saying on the platform we also look at the behavior of how they're using the products and, right. and see if those things match up so you know we have a bunch of different instruments instruments that we use are to, there gaps between what people say they want on the platform and what they do sometimes and Sometimes that's because people's aspirational behavior is does not match with their actual behavior and that's getting back to yeah us trying to figure out and help enable people to align their most mindful mm -hmm. aspirations with how they behave in real life. Right. Um, so I can say, well, you know, I want to spend less time using social media, but you know, maybe that's it's not my inclination. Quit. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything else to add on that. The the one thing that this. Um, one thing that made, this makes me think about is the power of story and how when we can connect with the power of story that mm -hmm. people have, how it really sends a chill in, for, for all of us to, to see the creative process by which um, 
by which folks are innovating out there with the tools that are being developed, the features. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to say that because we are all constantly living in the world of numbers. Yeah. And it's, it's all most of us uh, not just think about, but give credence to. Um, but it's sometimes very difficult to just un to think of the moments when it has been a single story or it has yeah. been someone's touch or just someone's unique experience that has made you yeah. move, that it felt. Well, what do you do to bring things well, out of that quantitative mindset yeah. and into the sort of qualitative mindset? Like what, what are the ways that you can give an individual's voice or experience or story the same power as, but the data show they want this? Yeah, I mean, I, we work really hard to make sure we balance qualitative research with quantitative research, because quantitative research, when I say that, it means you know the statistics mostly around the use of the product at scale, so millions if not billions of people doing X, Y, and Z, versus actually observing an individual person and what their experience is. And it's critical to balance those things because not everything that's important is measurable by numbers. Right. And you can really tap into incredibly important things through individual stories. I'll share a very specific example, even though it's a bit of a painful one. Um, so a couple of years ago, it was actually for Facebook's um, 10th anniversary. <laughs> and so we thought, oh, how are we going to celebrate this? this? is kind of a big deal. And in typical Facebook fashion, because the company doesn't, and I know, again, this may not seem this way from the outside, but we don't like to put ourselves in the middle of the story because it's really about the community and the people using the products. So the thing that we created was this year in review, right? It's like, mm -hmm. celebrate you know, with us the year that you had on Facebook. And because we were excited and feeling optimistic, that experience was designed and the language that was used was like, hey, it's been a great year. Here's a review of that year that you spent on Facebook. And um, I mean, I'm just like dreading telling you the rest of the story. So predictably, um, you know, we, because, of, because we're dealing with so many people, we actually, in the background, proactively generated some of these videos on behalf of people. Because actually generating automatic uh, videos for two billion people, it takes a lot of processing yeah. power, yeah. right? And so we did it in the background, and then we were proactively saying, and some of you might see this you know, in your feed sometimes, it's like, hey, you know, here's like a friendversary video or whatever. Well, this was the first time we did this. And uh, a guy named Eric Meyer, who's a developer and, and blogger, um, was kind of dreading because he had seen these year in review videos and then he comes across one and it's a picture of his daughter who died this year. Like that was the photo that we put as the title picture for this video. And he wrote this amazing blog post that said it was entitled Unintentional Algorithmic Cruelty. Mm. And it was an incredibly generous blog post because he was mm. like, nobody at Facebook wanted to like destroy my day. <laughs> but this is what happened. I was dreading seeing a video of my, my past year, because it was the worst year of my life, and there, there she was, just looking at me. And this thing kind of went viral, and the team was devastated. We invited him to come speak at Facebook. He pulled zero punches with us. He said a statement that I will never forget. He said, um, when you say edge case, what you're actually defining is the limits of what you care about, which was like, oof. <laughs> and he was right. And we have forever changed our approach to those experiences of mm -hmm. not assuming where people are at with their lives. Um, and that was like a, a difficult lesson to learn, but something we never would have picked up in the logs. Yeah. Um, yeah, Eric is, uh, is remarkable. Yep. Um, and his daughter, Rebecca, um, I think has been one of those people that every product designer thinks about because Eric has been such a good advocate for her and her memory. And I think um, we had been building, uh, the startup I was doing at the time, social media analytics tool and had bumped up against the same thing because Eric is a friend and was one of our beta testers. And he'd flagged the issue and we sort of ran into something similar. And you know, he had that empathy to say that he's made products and be able to understand that thing. But what I think, and Eric, and, and, and um, he collaborated on a book later sort of about mm -hmm. these issues, and it was very good. One of the things that jumped out of that to me was he had access to us, to the industry, to a mm -hmm. blog that people read, to designers. So a thousand dads had that experience before he mm -hmm. did. Mm. 
right? And that weighed on me, I think just like with your team, a lot. Yeah. Um, I want to shift into these questions because they're excellent, but I just want to sort of, the, all these are incredible. I want us to go fast because I want to cover these yep. and people sort of ask a lot of things. A lot of the conversation around uh, social media in general has been around addictiveness and this framework yep. of people getting hooked. So the question is, what would you say to someone that argues Facebook engineered an environment with addictive properties for its users and that, that positive reinforcement, that, that adrenaline booster, that, you know, that, that buzz you get from likes or from responses? You know, I think when you're starting a product, measuring time spent actually is like a pretty good indicator that you've created something of value, right? Because if people are spending time using it, there's this sense of, oh, it must be interesting and sticky. Mm -hmm. the, the challenge is we grew so fast um, that we then started to realize, and, and grateful actually for the outside criticism about this, is like, mm -hmm. That it, the end result, if you take that to its logical conclusion, is not good for people in society, right? right. So I think you know, taking that metric and that orientation when you're starting a new product makes sense. It's just a question of um, you know, evolving and being clear that when you reach the scale that we're at, that that's the wrong metric to use, and that's where we're at. There's a related question. Is how do we develop ways to treat human attention as a natural resource worthy of protection, and how do we gather attention sustainably? I like that framework. Mm -hmm. I think of trust as a natural resource, too. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think the other part of it is not taking for granted what we bring when we use a tool like Facebook, like any tool. Um, mm. That it is a, it's a situation we're using with others, it's a situation we're using with our children, our, our partners, et cetera. There's a lot of offline things that occur and that we don't want to forget that the, in the use of any tool, you, know, we, we, you need that nurturance, you need that kind of embellishment. I'll never forget a statistic uh, that Steve Levitt, the economist, uh, the free economics author, presented a paper in which he was talking about it is not actually reading to your uh, child that is correlated with improved success in, in later in life. It's the presence of books in the home. Mm. Right? And you think, well, what's the use of having books if you're not reading? But it's the idea that the book is a is a, an object that probably carries other things in the home will be there if yeah. the book well, is Well, certainly a signifier of disposable income and real estate and the other things. Exactly. Um, is there evidence that people would pay to use Facebook and free services in exchange for more confidentiality or to prevent the sale or use of their personal data? You know, I haven't been directly involved in the research around that. I do think that there's a pretty significant limitation globally to how far that could go, so mm -hmm. that's always the trade-off. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think in the, in the industry, a lot of people that are sort of deep inside these conversations talk about um, not having privacy be a luxury good. Yes. Right? Yep. Um, these are all really great questions, so thank you, everybody. Uh, how do you conduct research to see how users respond to complex ethical questions that you struggle with internally? Uh, again, I want to just focus on this idea <clears throat> of how powerful stories are. So we will take teams and we'll go and spend time with people. Um, because in, in some ways, that becomes the, the process of a dialogue being created. And you can understand what are their concerns or what are their anxieties. It's sometimes very difficult to, un to <coughs> ask a question, bless you, and then you. to get the answer you're looking for in a direct way when you're interviewing. So uh, designers, researchers, data scientists will go and spend time with people and create conversation. Mm -hmm. And some of those things actually come up when people start revealing people problems, things that they're trying to resolve or things that they're trying to deal with, and that becomes a space we can have an ethical conversation or a conversation about ethics. On the ground research, on the ground research in India with women who had concerns about uploading photos they referenced before, I think is a really good example of that, where it's like, it's one thing to see that those are issues, but it's another thing to go in and participate in in-home research and really understand the family dynamics and to figure out how do you design systems that are gonna take that whole you know, social context into, into the design process. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very powerful. I'm gonna do one last question, sort of merging two things that came out here. One is as a for-profit company, how do you avoid just prioritizing the most valuable, like highest spending users as, mm. as who you design for? And similarly, how do you find the balance as designers between providing a valuable user experience and manipulating attention in order mm -hmm. to, to put ads in front of people or profit from those ads? Well, again, um, and we need to do a better job of kind of being transparent about how and why we do things. That's sure. part of you know, why we're here is there's a lot of short-term revenue we could generate that we leave on the table every day. <laughs> 
if we were just looking to optimize short-term revenue, mm -hmm. um, it would be a very short-sighted right. way to operate. That sounds um, a little bit like what my older sister would be like, I'm not touching you, and like, you don't get credit for that, though. <laughs> like, that's no, what you're supposed to do. Absolutely, yeah. but I guess what I'm saying is, <laughs> If you keep that long-term view in mind mm. and say, listen, if we violated people's trust and just did things to kind of manipulate them and get as much revenue as we can, we would erode people's trust, they would stop using our products, and we would be sunk as a business. So the key, and Mark is really, really good at this, is just to take the long view on things, be willing to forego growth and revenue in the interest of something that has longer-term value, and that in the long run, we believe, will make us a stronger business. Um, as we sort of get ready to wrap up, one of the things I want to do is um, call out the, the sort of the processes by which people give feedback. I think this is something that's sort of come up in a lot mm. of these refrains. So many of these questions um, really key on like that sense of building that trust and want to understand. Um, and maybe I'll sort of actually take one or two more of these here. Um, uh, actually, this is a great one to that point about addiction. So we've not been using our phones while we've been on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't sneak any glimpses at my messages. So I feel pretty proud of that. Um, and uh, uh, Tim, who's a high school teacher, says, I see teenagers that are incapable of being off of their phone for this long a period of time. Should we fight or embrace that shift? Like, is, is that just a cultural norm that's shifted and we're all old fogies for objecting to it? Yeah, I mean, I'm a parent of three teenagers, so this is something that is very top of mind for mm -hmm. me. I do believe we're going through a very awkward transition phase right now where the interfaces and the devices... Um, the internet's a teenager too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, um, I, I don't know exactly where the experiences are heading, but the current way of interfacing with technology is, is not sustainable. Mm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. we cannot, five years from now, still be walking around looking on these devices. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a colossal failure of the design <laughs> and technology community. Yeah. Um, and so we need to figure out how do we create the right controls, boundaries, and incentives for people to, again, align their use with their aspirational values, not the thing that you know, we, you know, like as an industry, you know, are, are you know, able to create these experiences that you know, get people to do things versus what do people really want to do? How do we empower those things? Because that's what's gonna keep them coming back. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a few minutes less a day, but if they stay 10 more years, that's right. a good math that, outcome. That, that pays off. <laughs> um, I wanna close with sort of a bigger question, which is not just about Facebook, but about the sort of tech industry generally. Um, what's the, what, what should be our broader ambitions? What should be the more ambitious things we strive to do because there's, there's mission statements, right? We're going to connect the world and we're going to do those things. But I think, like, specific tactics, like, connect the world can mean anything, mm -hmm. right? You can have a party and I connect to the world. Think about, like, if you could set one ambitious goal for yourself, of in, you know, by the time your time at Facebook is done, what do you want to be able to have planted your flag in to say, this is a thing that, uh, that I accomplished? At the level of the industry yeah. as a whole. Yeah, big picture. Uh, well, I, I, I'm going to say it in kind of old fuddy-duddy words, reflect my age. So what I think that a lot of what we don't have as an industry is a sense of our social contract. Mm -hmm. What is the thing that holds us together and what, do we, what are we kind of obligated to do in society? What is our role, et cetera? Mm. I mean, it, partly it's probably the, the lack of diversity in the industry. Partly it's the pace that we work in. But I think it's also a kind of a, we are a reflection of where our society is overall. We are divided. Um, and we have to think, I think, more consistently about what it is that you know, brings us together and what are we a part of that's common um, and do more deep thinking on that. I think as a, as a designer, um, as like a humanist, mm -hmm. a technologist, what I hope is that we will figure out how to leverage technology to make the circumstances, whether it's geography or socioeconomic background, what have you, have far less impact on people's opportunities. Like, I think that's a huge opportunity. Right now, people's opportunities are dramatically impacted by where they just end up being born in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's something that we don't always feel as much. I mean, certainly in Silicon Valley we don't, sure. but even in the United States. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a divide that technology can either widen or close. 
And it's extremely important that we engage so it becomes the, the, the thing that brings it closer together. Mm -hmm. um, I lied, I'm gonna ask one more. Um, <laughs> the, well, the, you know, we're lucky to get this chance. I think um, it, it does seem like there's this magic castle where you all mm. do this work and, and okay. even being in the industry, it's a little bit opaque. Um, if something's really wrong, if you hear somebody's voice and they say, this thing is not treating me right, can you go to Mark Zuckerberg and be heard and have a confidence that it'll change, that you you have the, the ability to impact that product and like pull the brakes and say, we're, we're messing up? Every single employee every Friday has that opportunity. <laughs> every Friday, we gather together, and Mark and Cheryl and the entire leadership team are there, and people get up to the microphone where they submit questions through a voting process so that we wanna make sure our global audiences and people who are like in crazy time zones, and they ask questions way tougher than anything that goes on outside the company, honestly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and real change comes out of those conversations. It's one of the most impressive parts of the culture is really cultivated this expectation to, to question leadership and authority and to ask the tough questions because that's the biggest risk to us is that we know something's going on, we need to change, and we're afraid to even raise the issue. And that, I think, is a real strength of the company. I don't know what's yeah, I, I, I thought Mark did really well at Congress, and I think the reason why is that every Friday he just gets <laughs> grilled <laughs> more and more. I really feel for him. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to hold you to it. Thank you both for making the Thank time. You. Yeah. you all please join me. Give me a round.